Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. Y'all can be seated. Uh, good morning. Y'all good? Man, I love this. Y'all are excited this morning. How many of you guys, I just, I, I got a question for you. How many of you guys are going to make New Year's resolutions starting this week? Raise your hand. Come on. Few. Wow, so few. So I guess you loathe New Year's res resolutions, right? How many of you just loathe them? Just don't like them, right? Yeah. Gyms love them. Gyms love them. Because this next three months, gyms are going to make more money and people aren't going to show up. And they're thinking banking money because all of us have this commitment. Where we're going to lose some weight, right? We're going to eat right. We're going to do right and all that kind of stuff. And, and so there's, there's these things that go on this time of the year, as Jake was talking about, that we get motivated of thinking, man, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to, I'm going to clean out the Bowflex I've had for 28 years. That's now a plant hanger. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to clear it out. But in the next three days, it's going to pile back in and, and then I won't. But I'll walk by it every day and I'll think about it. What motivates you? That's a question has been on my mind all week this week. What motivates us? I'll tell you one thing that motivates me is clowns. I will run from a clown, amen? Anybody else? Yeah, you see me running, there's a clown chasing me. I just don't like, and listen, if, if you're a clown in this room, like a professional clown, not, not like some of you are, but a professional clown, I don't, I don't have anything against you. I, I just think they're creepy, amen? I, I do. Here, here's something else that motivates me, fishing. Yeah. Uh, let's just take a moment. <laughs> Amen. See, I think we all have those things that motivate us. I was, I was reading this last week about the largest man-made hole in the world up to this point. In 1866, it was dug by primitive tools, leather buckets, um, uh, just just incredible deal. And the story is there was this uh, group of children playing on this hill in South Africa. And, and as they were throwing rocks at each other, because that's what kids do, um, there was a man that came by and picked up one of the rocks and he noticed something very very unique about this rock. It was a diamond. And literally when he discovered that there were diamonds in them, their hills, men came from all over the world with pickaxes and shovels. And they dug one of the largest holes in the world up to that moment. It's amazing what'll motivate us. That hole, I, I got to looking at that. When they finally shut it down, it was 42 acres in circumference. 790 feet deep, picks, axes, and shovels. Think about that. It, it yielded over three tons of diamonds. In fact, the, the beer company ended up buying it, you know, the, the diamond company, and, and ran it for years, and they finally shut it down. It's amazing what will motivate people to go and dig with a picks act, pickaxe, a shovel, leather buckets, pulley systems. In fact, there's a, there's a little um, uh, kind of hut there that you can go if you're ever there in, in uh, Kimberly, South Africa, and you can go in and see all these pictures of how they did it. And it's just absolutely amazing. It's amazing how certain things will motivate certain people to do incredible things. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was going by to see a good friend of mine uh, where he works, and we just was stopping in, and, and he was introducing me to the different staff there at this place, and I met this one young man, I don't remember his name, but he made such an impact on me because we, we were talking uh, that day, and, and, and my friend introduced me as his pastor, and he goes, oh, really, you pastor? And he started asking me where I pastor, and so I just asked the next question, where do you go to church? And he goes, well, I do go to church. He said, but don't get me talking about Jesus because I'll never shut up. And man, was he right. 
This brother literally went on for almost 45 minutes. He's in his late 20s. And we made a connection. I know his uncle, and, and we kind of made these connections on this. And God miraculously healed him five years ago. And he had gotten saved when he was a young man, but he had done what many of us had done, and he had walked away from the Lord. And I remember standing there in that office and he started quoting scripture and he started talking about men that he was praying for and ministering to. And we were actually at a car dealership. And if you've ever been in a car dealership with those open offices there, I mean, everybody could hear him in there just testifying about how good the Lord is. And he said, and he said the statement, he said, let me tell you something. When, when you realize how much God has done for you, man, and how much he's forgiven you, you'll never, ever, ever be the same. And he said, I'm telling you, you can't shut me up. You're not going to shut me up. And nobody will ever make me be quiet about what Jesus has done in my life. And listen, you don't have to believe. And, and, and it was like he was preaching. And I'm sitting there going, I'm calling this brother my church, man. I'm going to have him preach. And, and, and literally he was like, going, man, I'm just telling you, I, I, if, if the church could just get it. If the church could just get it. See, I'm convinced that motivation is, is one of the most important things for the church of Jesus Christ. We, we talk about methods and materials and money and manpower, but see, without motivation, without something that's driving that, it doesn't really amount to much at all. It just amounts to a bunch of us gathering together. There's something powerful about the motivation of the early Christians like the Apostle Paul. There's passages of scripture when you'll read Paul and he, he's talking about what motivates him. In fact, I want you to look at one this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to look through a couple of verses. But in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, we're going to start right there this morning. In fact, he says this, for Christ love compels. Everybody say compels. What compels you? For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. See, Paul here is understanding the love of Christ became a dramatic and powerful motivation for him. It became so powerful in his life that he literally spent the rest of his days going around planting churches all over Minor Asia. It compelled him. And some of you may be sitting here this morning because you grew up in church and going, yeah, but hey, I'm not the Apostle Paul. You're not, and neither am I. But I'll tell you this, all of us have the same message that he received. All of us in this room have the same message that Paul received. But where's our motivation? You see, I think it would be perfectly proper for each of us to say with all in sincerity that it is the love of Christ that compels us. It is the love of Christ that compels us to feed over 100 tons of food to communities in this, around this area. It is Christ's love that compels us to change diapers in the nursery. It's Christ's love that compels us to get back there and sing with children. It's Christ's love that compels us to love on those children at Hawkins Elementary and send them backpacks. It's Christ's love that compels us that when we're sitting at Red Rooster that we're talking to people about Jesus, man, and letting them and mingling and smelling like them and, and being around them. It's Christ's love that compels us. <laughs> that word compel that Paul used literally means, listen, it's so good. It says to him in, to hold on on both sides, to take away all the options, to give no way out, to back into a corner, that we would be hemmed in by the love of Christ. That the love of Christ would hem us in to hold on to both sides, to take away the options, to give no way out, to know, to back, go ahead, go ahead, Jesus, back me into a corner because it's your love that compels us. <laughs> See, Paul's saying here, the love of Christ takes away our options. It backs us into a corner, holds us firmly on both sides and gives us no way out. And when we become motivated like that, we become a great Power for God's glory and the world's blessing. You ever been backed into a corner? You know what my daddy used to tell me? Don't you back me in a corner, boy. You back me in a corner and you're going to find something you may not like. That's what Paul's talking about. That we've been backed into a corner. There's no way out. And the only thing that has holding us on all sides is Christ's love for us. It's his love for us. That Paul was compelled or motivated the love of Christ compelled Paul because he understood that while we were still sinners, 
God demonstrated his love towards us in Christ's death. I think we've heard that so many times that literally it just kind of passed over some of us right now. It doesn't even matter. That's what I loved about that young man at that dealership where he just said, I'm telling you, man, when the church gets this, it'll never be the same. The love of God in Christ was unique and it transcends any human power. And the wisdom of God transcends any human wisdom. And the love of God transcends any human love. And Paul just said, look, it's his love that compels me to do what I do. The incredible, gracious love doesn't demand that we stop being sinners. God didn't come to us and say, I will love you if. No, 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 no. God's love is more than just a warm, fuzzy feeling. God's love took Jesus to the cross for us that he came fully man. We just looked through the whole Christmas season that the incarnate God came and lived among us and took our sins upon us so that you and I could be made right and live in the gracious love and peace of God in relationship with him. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that Christ who knew no sin was made sin for us to make us righteous. He says in that same passage that God no longer counts our sins against us. That when he sees us, I'm telling you, this is huge because some of you haven't gotten this yet, that you still think of yourself as this lowly, no good, shameful person. When, listen, God said through Jesus Christ in a relationship with him, he no longer counts our sins against us. That you don't have to be who you used to be. That you can be changed. The problem is, the root human problem is this dynamic disease called sin. That sin separates us. And for many of us, our sin is like an old volcano. That there's something brewing underneath. And, and you know, if a volcano brews long enough and that volcano begins to build pressure inside, if you've ever seen a volcano, sometimes it'll, it'll come out the side and sometimes it'll come out the bottom and it's towards the top. But there's gonna be this some point where that volcano, because of what's inside, is going to blow its top. So it is with us. You see, I don't know what formed your character. I don't know what formed where you are. Some of you grew up in a very different lifestyle than I did. But all of us have sin inside of us. And at some point, that sin is going to erupt. And there's absolutely nothing you and I can do about it. You see, God demonstrated his incredible love towards us and he took the initiative knowing full well that a volcano is gonna do what a volcano does when the pressure builds up enough, it's going to blow. And so God took the initiative and stepped into our world and became a sacrifice for us. He invited Jesus to take our sins on him that God would no longer count our sins, that thing that's going inside, that he would take that away and forgive us and put something new in us that he would reckon the sin to Christ and reckon us to righteousness in Christ. You know, I, I was thinking this last week about old bank ledgers. Y'all remember those? Because now we got QuickBooks and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you don't have to think to be a banker. No, no don't say that. Because um, <laughs> bankers don't get up and walk out. It, it, it's, 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 it's so much easier today. But back in the day, they had these big leather books and they would go in there and they'd write down the debt and they'd write down credits and all of that. Imagine that there's this big bank ledger in heaven. And in that bank ledger, there's my name, Edward Crouch. And he starts adding up all the debt of sin in my life. And he gets all the way to 2018, almost 2019. And he looks at that and goes, that boy is in trouble. <laughs> Fill your name in. That God would add up all the debt of our life, all the debt of sin in our life. And then imagine that he takes that number and he pulls it over onto Christ and he moves all of my debt over to the ledger book of Jesus Christ and he moves my sin and gives it and applies it to Jesus Christ. But it gets better than that because then imagine he takes all the righteousness of Christ and he moves it off that ledger book and he puts it under my name, credit the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness is this debt cleared. <laughs> I tell you, that changes things. 
You ever paid off a debt? I, I have more than my share, amen? I, I remember just several years ago when we paid off $60,000 in about 35 minutes. Oh, it was incredible. We sold a house, so don't, we didn't rob a bank. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me going, where'd you get 60 grand? I can't tell you. Anyway, um, paid off our cars. We paid off some debt we shouldn't have never had in credit cards. We got to give a big old fat check to Summit. We, argued over who we did argue over who got to write the checks. <laughs> I've never seen 60 grand go through my bank so fast. It was incredible. But I'm just telling you, I remember when we got home that night, we, we, had, we were living at a point where I couldn't afford any of the upper channels on, on satellite, but I also couldn't afford to cancel satellite. And so I had to keep it, you know, down to the lowest level. And I remember laying in bed that night and uh, I, I was watching TV and it's like a light bulb went off. I can afford the full package. And I got up in my skippies and I stood at the edge of the bed and I got that remote out and I subscribed to everything Satellite had because I could afford it. <laughs> Probably not the best decision, but it sure was fun. <laughs> There's something about being debt free, isn't it? There's something about freedom. And that's what Jesus did. See, Paul never, ever recovered from the discovery that all the unrighteousness of Saul of Tarsus had been credited to Christ and taken to the cross. All of your ugliness, even right now, all of that has been credited to Jesus Christ and you are forgiven. <laughs> he never recovered from that. All the glorious righteousness of Christ had been credited to Saul of Tarsus and it hemmed him in. He couldn't escape it. He never got over it. It's what compelled him. The love of Christ compelled him. It, it hemmed him in. It took away his options. It backed him into a corner where the only thing he could do is talk about Jesus. Is talk about what Jesus had done, not religion. They had just as much religion in Paul's day as we have in ours. And the enemy, all he's done is get us to debate religion. Listen, there's no debate when it comes to a changed life. You can debate religion all day long. You ask a wife when her husband got saved how that changed him. And I'm telling you, all the critics in the world has no answers to that. Because the only thing that can explain it is Jesus. That's it. That's it. You see, Christ's love compels us. Why? Look at verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced. Everybody say convinced. We're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. That word convinced that the love of Christ hems us up to a solid conviction. Os Guinness said this, one of the problems in our contemporary culture is that sentiment has taken the place of conviction. That sentiment has taken the place of a conviction. See, sentiment is a sincere and refined sensibility. A tendency to be influenced by emotion rather than reason or fact. So we appeal to sentiment. And it has the tendency to take place of conviction because conviction is gonna cost you something where emotionalism is not gonna cost you as much. How many of you guys remember the whales that were trapped under the ice up in Alaska years ago? Y'all remember that? And I remember like, uh, looking at that and I don't have anything against whales. I like fish, they taste good, okay? And so I got no problem with whales, but I remember watching that on TV. And all the world's resources were brought to. And people's hearts were pulled out. And people started bribing money and going to volunteer. And they freed up the whales and everybody went home. And I remember sitting there watching that. I'm going, what about those kids that are starving? And listen, they're not just starving today. And two months from now, they're going to have food. They're still hungry. I read a newsletter this morning from my friend Mike Curry about Kenya. That for 17 years, they've been building feeding stations in Kenya, Africa. And they hadn't even made a dent. You see, I think many of us are sentimental about Jesus. But there are a few of us really convinced. 
convinced. We like the notion of being fully loved and fully forgiven, but what do you do with it? We get a little emotional on Sunday morning and we might give a little and we might volunteer one Sunday. What compels you to be convinced for the world out there that's dying? Oh, they don't look like they're dying. They look great. They're driving new cars. They live in great houses. Some of the finest homes in the world are right here in Hawkins, America. If you don't believe me, go with me to Haiti. Go with me to Accra, Africa. Go with me sometime. And I'll show you that your worst situation is better than two-thirds of the world. What compels you that you would be so convinced that you would be hemmed in in a corner and you can't get over it. In verse 15, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. See, Paul's conviction, he's working very logically towards his conviction here. And I don't want you to miss this because if it's true that Christ died for all, then there's a sense in which all died. If it's true that all died, now listen to this, that all died in Christ, then that is either the end of them or they have been raised to life with Christ. That's the beginning of something utterly new. Listen, if we died in Christ and we're raised in Christ, that means the old is gone, the new has come. And Paul's working through this. His conviction was simply this, that he has been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he lives. Amen. Yet now that life he lives doesn't live in and of himself. He lives because Christ lives in him. The reason he's breathing, the reason he's making tents, the reason he's starting churches, the reason he's doing all that he's doing and writing letters and going to jail and getting beaten, going without clothes, going without food, is because I'm telling you, he's convinced that the world needs Jesus, man. <laughs> That's conviction. Totally convinced. You see, one of the ways that the gospel is being abused in churches today, I tweeted this this week, is that somewhere along the way, we feel we have the freedom to ask Christ to die for our continued self-indulgence. Let me say that again, because you may have missed it. That many of us have abused the gospel. We know Jesus died on the cross. I, I've not said anything to anybody in this room that doesn't, that you've not already just gone, yeah, I know that. The problem with that is, is we now have taken the gospel and we're asking Jesus to bless our self-indulgence. <laughs> Paul puts it this way. When people come to faith in Christ, it is in order that they might be made new. In other words, in Christ, the new has come and the old is gone. Transformed. That we have been Transformed. We have been converted. You ever been through a conversion at your office where they're going to convert one program to another program? And, and it sometimes takes months and sometimes it takes a year. But the whole point of converting something is to move from something old and to move to something new. That's what Jesus did. That's who we are. That the old life is gone and there's something new in us and being solidly convinced that we have no freedom to live as the way we used to. Being solidly convinced that I don't have to live the way I used to live. I'm never going to get over it. You're not going to shut me up. And I'm telling you, man, I don't want to argue Book of Revelation. I don't want to argue, argue Armenian versus Calvinism. Who cares? It's Jesus, man. And he changed me. He changed me. And by the way, he's coming back. Just be ready when he gets back, Okay. Whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, or whatever trib, <laughs> just be ready. It's called being transformed. Notice the second thing in verse, 15, it's verse 16 about this hemming in of the Apostle Paul. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation has come and the old is gone, the new is here. And all, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he 
has committed to us the message of reconciliation. See, Paul is arriving at this striking conclusion. He's no longer free to look at people the way he used to. See, when Jesus takes a hold of your life and you're transformed, you no longer look at your wife the same. You no longer look at your husband the same. Listen, if you're looking at your husband the same way you look at him when, he, when you weren't saved as you are today, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. You see, if the love of Christ was made available to all people so that Christ died for all, then it is perfectly obvious that if, I'm in, if, if, that if Christ loved all these people through enough to die for them, listen to this, I no longer have the freedom to look at them differently than Christ looks at them. Getting quiet in here. <laughs> See, I begin to look at other people whom Christ loves through an entirely new set of lenses. I no longer have the freedom to judge them. Mm. Come on. See, the reason Paul was so convinced is because Paul never forgot who he was, Saul of Tarsus. He, he was a brilliant rabbi. He probably knew the Old Testament better than anybody else. In fact, you go back and read his credentials, he, he'll tell you he studied more, knew more, and was more zealous than any other rabbi there in his day. And see, Saul the rabbi, let me just work through this because I want you to hear this. Saul the rabbi believed everyone who hangs on a tree is accursed. Now, look what happens. Jesus of Nazareth hung on a tree. Therefore, Jesus of Nazareth was accursed. That's simple logic. But see, Saul took it further. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. Well, Messiahs can't be accursed. Therefore, Jesus is not the Messiah. So Saul of Tarsus now takes his logical conclusion a step further and says that Jesus got what he deserved. He's a blasphemer. He's accursed. And the curse rightly rests on him. His misguided followers must be stopped. So guess what Saul did? He set it out as his goal to uh, get rid of as many Christ followers. Remember, he's a rabbi. Remember, he's, he studied in the Old Testament. He knows it. And, and, and through his simple logic, he said, there's no way that Jesus could be the Messiah. But the encounter with Christ, something changed. Listen, you can't refute a changed life. I'm gonna say that again. You can't refute a changed life. You see, Saul was convinced that Jesus was wrong and he was right, just like some of you. Uh, don't judge Saul. Because some of you think you've got it right too. And you've been asking Jesus to bless your indulgence for years. Look what happened. Saul all of a sudden realized that Saul is wrong and Jesus is right. He's not accursed. He is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God with authority proven by the resurrection from the dead. And you know what Paul's whole conclusion of that is? I am the chief of sinners. In other words, I need Jesus. That is a radical change of mind. By the way, repentance is just a change of mind. You know that, don't you? It's metanoia. Okay, remember that? We taught that last year. He repented. He changed his mind. And Paul also says that now he understands Christ's love for people was such that he died for all. And so he no longer had the freedom to look at people the way he did before. He's now looking at people through Jesus' eyes. Think of that coworker. Think, think of that, that uncle you had to spend last Tuesday with. <laughs> and he's coming back this Tuesday. See, it's not uncommon to hear in the church, I don't like him. I don't like her. I, and I, you know what? I'm just not going to take that anymore. I'm just not going to take that anymore. Why in the world does they get all the recognition and I don't? And outside the church, we discover that even the Christians are despising certain members of a larger community. In our convenient, comfortable evangelical churches, we reserve the right to regard other people from a human point of view. And Paul is basically saying here, the love of Christ takes away that option. It takes away the option. 
You can't no longer view people from a humanistic standpoint because of what Jesus has done. I'm convinced, man, and you're not going to change. I'm not going to look at people the same. (laughs) The love of Christ leads us to I'm no longer free to look at people from just a purely worldly point of view. Now look at verse 20. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. Look what happens. Because now Paul is compelled, he's convinced, he's no longer looking at people the same. And then look at verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors. Everybody say ambassador. Come on, say it one more time, ambassador, come on. Yeah, we are Christ's ambassador as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Listen, here's what an ambassador is. An ambassador goes and lives in another country. It's a country that's not their own. They represent the kingdom from which they come. Then when they go to that kingdom, they don't espouse their own opinions or their own thoughts. They only espouse the thoughts of their home country. And so as an ambassador of Christ, they come over into another country country and they do not have an opinion. They do not have a judgment. They're only speaking what their leader has told them. It doesn't take a scientist to figure out how this applies in the kingdom. Amen. This is not our home. We are ambassadors of the king and our home is somewhere foreign. And now we are living in a foreign land waiting to go home, but we are Christ ambassadors. (laughs) Our greatest need is to produce men and women who will go and be an ambassador to this world, to be compelled, to be convinced, to listen, man, I'm not gonna look at the world the same. I'm not gonna do the same things they do, but I'm telling you, man, I wanna make sure they know Jesus, amen? Amen. That's why we exist. (laughs) You see, the committed think in terms of the spiritual, not the material. The committed. They don't get mad when we give a talk on giving because they're convinced. I was reading this morning from my buddy down in Austin. He was writing an article on on generosity because this is when preachers usually talk about generosity. By the way, we're done with that because we approved our budget. We're gonna move on, okay? Because here's what we believe. Committed people don't get angry about giving because they're compelled. They're committed. It's the love of Christ. Oh, I know. So easy to become absorbed, isn't it? Material concerns, human thinking, and we lose the glorious truth of the gospel that Jesus died for us. Listen, he's coming back. And I'm convinced it could be any day. But just like Jesus told his disciples, boys, I don't know the day because God hadn't told me. Daddy has not told me yet. And unlike my kids, we're not going to come back and and berate him. You're coming back, you're coming back, you're coming back. Can I, can I, dad, 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 dad. Y'all remember that? I'm going to be busy of communicating what Jesus has done. He's coming back and he's going to resurrect his church. Are you ready? You see, the only reason it hadn't happened is the incredible patience of God who's not willing that any should perish. We were at the Red Rooster the other night and we were watching karaoke. That's fun. (laughs) It's awesome. I mean, it really is. Y'all laugh like I'm being, it was fun. I'm telling you, man. God would desire that no man should perish. What compels you? What motivates you? See, as a pastor, your pastor, I have a desire that we be more than just self-indulgent church people. That there would be something that compels us and moves us to win people to Jesus, to train them and to send them out, to win them to Jesus that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. No longer free to look at people. I don't care what color their skin is, whether they have hair or no hair, or a bunch of hair, bunch of ink, no ink, holes in their body. I don't look at them anymore. I see them through Christ's eyes. See, well, I want that for you. I want that for us. Just go hang out at Red Rooster. 
on the weekend. And just get over in the corner and get you a table and just watch. There's, listen, there was about 15 of us, and I'm looking at some of you. We were hanging out together. Walk through Brookshire's and look at people a little bit different. Walk through your office this week and look at people a little bit different and begin to ask the question, are they ready? And then begin to develop a relationship with them. See, all it takes is people rightly motivated. Some of us are only motivated by that new car, new boat. I know. <laughs> It'll motivate me. I, I, amen? What motivates you to move you past emotion to see in people either as lost or your brother and sister? As lost without Jesus or your brother and sister in Christ. See, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, the mission of Summit Heights Fellowship can be summed up in three words. Win, train, send. Win the lost. We gotta win people to Jesus, man. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, it's gonna be hard to win people to Jesus if there's nothing changed in your life. I need a stool. I'm gonna sit down and just stop for a minute. Not really. We gotta win people to Jesus, man. And you know the greatest testimony of you winning somebody to Jesus is your changed life. Your changed life. See, I grew up, the way you win people to Jesus is you don't dip, cuss, chew, all that stuff. Don't dance, don't play cards, don't play dominoes. I mean, come on now. Well, no, 42 was okay in church, but, um, you know, it was all behavior. See, there's, there's something inside that'll change the outside. Just as a volcano of sin will erupt and destroy the mountain, so too when Jesus takes that out, he replaces it with his spirit and it changes everything. Because now what comes out once you've died and you've been raised again in Christ Jesus in the spiritual sense is now Jesus lives in you and it changes you. So we want to win the loss, get people just to admit their sin, believe in Jesus and confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Listen, evangelism is not that hard. What makes evangelism hard is our self-indulgence and asking God to bless it. Second of all, we want to train those people we win. Dedicate to training people. That's why we do small groups. In a couple of weeks, one of our elders and Jake are going to be up here, and they're going to be teaching through our whole philosophy that when you come be a part of our church, this is how we want you to connect because we want you to be trained in maturity and ministry and missions and membership because we're all part of a family of winning, training, and sending people. We want you to know the word of God. We want you to obey the word of God. We want you to live the word of God. And lastly, we want to send disciples to impact the world. My buddy who was writing this morning, that Kenyan pastor, they, were, they, they showed a picture of a group of Kenyans praying over him. And he said, literally, he said, we won this guy to Christ seven years ago. And he has been discipled for seven years. This is incredible. Seven years, this brother was discipled and now they're sending him out to plant another church in the region of Kenya. And I know some of you are going, I'm out. <laughs> I'm not asking you to Kenya. Here's what I am asking you to do. Answer that question, what compels you? More than emotion, conviction conviction. You see, I want us to be a church that's dedicated to sending people for the mission possible, not impossible. We've been watching Mission Impossible over the holidays, some of the greatest movies ever made. Amen. Let's take a moment. Okay. Um, <laughs> My family, <laughs> my, my kids and my wife. Listen, it's not impossible. 
The mission is possible, not because of you, because of Jesus. It's Christ's love that compels us. And that's my challenge because next week we're gonna lay out this win, trained, send, because it's a, what we do is a, from a church. But I just wanted to say this morning is answer that question, what compels you? More than emotion. More than just, okay, I'll give. More than just, okay, I'll serve. More, more, more than I'll just come one week a month. And I'm hemmed in. I'm backed into a corner. And I ain't getting over it. I, I'm so moved by that young man. In fact, I'm going to go back by there this week. Not to see my friend, but I'm going to go see him. Because <laughs> I want to hear you more. It pumped me up. I was stoked. Love being around people like that. What compels you that you are committed to and convinced? And listen, it's the love of Jesus. He loves you. He's forgiven you. Do you hear that? You are forgiven. And if you'll invite him in to be the Lord of your life, I, I didn't say walk the aisle. I didn't say say some magic prayer. I'm saying invite him in to be the Lord of your life. Repent and confess your sins. I'm gonna tell you what'll happen. It's gonna change you. Yeah, it will. And people are gonna start looking at you in a whole different way. And they're gonna begin to ask questions. Your wife may even kiss you on the mouth. <laughs> may have bitten your ears. Your husband, it'll change. Your kids, people will see it. It's a mission possible. Listen, if you don't know Jesus this morning, he loves you. And all you have to do is admit you're a sinner. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your sins and you will be saved. And if you've never done that, I invite you. Do that this morning. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you this morning for a new year. That God, this next year, that we would win the lost, we would train those we win, and we would send those we train. God, the mission's been the same for over 2,000 years in the church. That's why we're here, because somewhere along the way, somebody won us. Somebody trained us. A church in Longview, Texas sent me. So God, I pray that we would be that church that connects people to God and others' relationship, winning training, sending. And God, if there's someone here this morning, man, woman, teenager, it doesn't matter that God, they realize this morning they've never confessed their sins. They've never believed on your name. God, they've never repented. God, would you give them courage right where they sit to admit they're a sinner, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they would confess their sins and they would walk out of here a new creation. So God, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for another year to get to declare your glory. And we ask all of it in that beautiful name, Jesus. And everybody said, hey, I sure love you. Next week, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, okay? So uh, we'll have two services, 9 and 11. Invite somebody with you. Bring somebody. Just ask your neighbor next door. What compels you? Bring them back. Let's pack this place out. and Let's see what God does next year. Amen? Have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.